to Teach Knock Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA. Another episode of Rabbi Michael Skobach's <laughs> cross <Cross-exam- laughs> Rabbi cross examines the New Testament. We have been out of the studio a little too long, in my opinion. It's okay. Good to have you back, Rabbi. How are you? <laughs> Man. Good morning, William. It's good to be back with you. Good morning. You know, they say the best way to keep uh, remembering how to ride a bike is to keep riding it. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, well, I don't know about all that, but, uh, well, it's good to have you back. Um, so, anyway, glad to have you here. Today's date is October 16th, 2023. Sad moments right now for Israel, uh, praying for Israel. Um, Jerusalem is under attack right now, so y'all keep them in prayer, please. And uh, Rabbi, I'm glad that you are here with us today. We miss you. Um, I'm hope, hoping you and your family are doing well. Thank God. It is a, it's a challenging time. I, I spoke to my class last night. I was giving a class in Pirkei Avot. And, uh, you know, if you go back to the first time that there's really a genocidal war against Israel. It's in Exodus chapter 17, where the nation of Amalek attacks the Israelites as they're coming out of Egypt. And we know that there was a biblical command that for all eternity to wipe out this people. And the problem is that we don't really know in terms of a national identity if anyone today in the world actually is a descendant of that tribe of Amalek. But the sages of Israel uh, have taught that really it's not something that is biological or genealogical, it's ideological. Right. That any people whose agenda is the destruction of Israel they are considered a Malik, the same way the Nazis, for example, um, were uh, in this mold. So Hamas and anyone that supports Hamas basically is in this mold of a Malik. And Israel fought on two fronts. We know that Joshua led a military battle fighting against a Malik. We know that Moses went up on the mountain and he raised his hands and the Torah tells us that when his hands were raised Israel was victorious in their fight when his hands were not raised Israel didn't do so good on the battlefield and the Talmud asks is it really the hands of Moses that really affected anything and the Talmud says no that basically when Moses' hands were raised, the eyes of Israel were raised heavenward in prayer. And it's those prayers that really swung things on the battlefield. And when Moses' hands were down and people were not directing their gaze up towards the heavens, it really means that their prayers slacked. And that's when we didn't do so well on the battlefield. And the truth is that we sitting here um, outside of Israel, I know that some of your viewers and listeners are in Israel, but anyone that's not on the front lines fighting in the military, we basically are part of that group that have our hands up. And we know that Moses needed support. Two people had to hold his hands up. Right. So... All of us really can be in that role of holding up the hands, which means we're, we're praying and we're supporting those who are praying. And we've got the backs of those who are on the front lines. And God willing, the prayers of all of the people in the world that have their heads on straight and have moral clarity and understand the clear difference between good and evil, are praying for the victory of good, the victory of Israel. And these prayers are really what is going to ultimately um, swing the day in the favor of Israel. So I want to just encourage everyone to pray using your own words, pray using the book of Psalms, um, and don't ever underestimate the efficacy 
of our prayers. They really have incredible, incredible impact in the spiritual realm. Um, so I have the picture of Jerusalem behind me. As you just said, Jerusalem at this very moment is being attacked. So as we're studying, we can also, we can multitask and we could also have our minds also directed in prayer towards the safety of people of Jerusalem and the safety of the IDF and of course for the healing of the wounded in Israel, the, rest the restoring of the captives and God willing the victory of good over evil in the coming hours and days. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for that. Really. So we're supposed to be doing Mark chapter six. And um, it's a really, really long chapter. It's pretty juicy. I hope we'll be able to cover most of it. Um, so it begins, we're going to look first at the first four verses. Um, and in these first four verses, Jesus comes to his hometown. He takes a visit to his hometown, which Mark tells us in chapter one of Mark in verse nine that Jesus' hometown is Nazareth. Now, this question of where Jesus is actually from is very, very confused in the Gospels. Um, for example, in the Gospel of Matthew, it's very clear that Jesus is born, according to the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is born in Beit Lechem or Bethlehem. And the only reason that he has any association at all with Nazareth is Matthew tells us that Jesus in Bethlehem was in great danger because Herod discovered that the Jewish Messiah, he was told, was going to be born in Bethlehem. Actually, there is no such prophecy that the Messiah has to be born in Beit. Lechem, but that's how the gospel understands the passage in the book of Micha, chapter 5. And so because the gospel of Matthew tells us that Herod basically sent troops to Beit Lechem to find this baby Jesus and kill him, Matthew tells us that, um, you know, he was so intent, Herod was so intent on nipping this potential Messiah in the bud that Matthew tells us that Herod's troops killed every baby boy under the age of two, not just in Beit Lechem, but in all the surrounding cities. Um, anyway, Jesus escapes. He goes down with his family to Egypt, and Matthew tells us that after the death of Herod, it was now safe to go back to the land of Israel. And Matthew tells us that Jesus was coming back with his family to Israel, but he was warned, his family was warned, that Judea, which is where Beit Lechem is, Beit Lechem is in the region of Judea, not far from Jerusalem, and he was told that since Herod's son, Archelaus was ruling in that area, um, it was still dangerous to go there. And so Matthew tells us in chapter 2 that Jesus and his family end up going to Nazareth. Now, why Nazareth? So here, Matthew basically invents a prophecy from the Tanakh. Matthew says in chapter 2, verse 23, that he went to Nazareth because there was a prophecy that the Messiah would be called a Nazarene. There obviously is no such prophecy. The town of Nazareth is not mentioned anywhere in the Tanakh. In any event, this is the story told in Matthew. Again, Matthew says that Jesus was born in Beit Lechem. That's his hometown. And he only ends up in Nazareth really to avoid the danger of going back to his hometown and because of this alleged prophecy that the Messiah is supposed to be called a Nazarene. 
But in Luke, if you go to the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, so we see that Jesus is from Nazareth. He's not from Beit Lechem. Jesus is from Nazareth. And the only reason he ends up in Beit Lechem, according to Luke, is that there is this bizarre story of a census that was being taken. And the Romans required that everyone return to their family city, the city of their family's origin. And since Joseph, the father of Jesus, was allegedly, his family was from the area of Beit Lechem. So basically the whole family moves from Nazareth to Beit Lechem to be counted in this census. Obviously the whole story is absurd because no one ever has the whole nation picking up and moving back to their hometown, their family's original hometown for a census. In a census, you want to know exactly where people are, not where they may have originally come from dozens and dozens and dozens of years ago. In any event, you have a very, very tremendous, a tremendous amount of confusion in the Gospels regarding really where Jesus was from. What's his actual hometown? And Mark here in chapter six tells us that when Jesus comes back to Nazareth, he teaches. In verse two, Mark says that he begins teaching in the synagogue. And Mark tells us that many of the listeners to Jesus were astonished. They were astonished. And they said, where did he get these things from? They're listening to him and they're saying, where did he get these things from? What is this wisdom that is given to him? Now, what's frustrating is that Mark never tells us what Jesus taught. It would have been very interesting for us to be able to hear what Jesus was teaching and for us to evaluate whether it was really so incredible and astonishing. And this actually, we're going to see, comes up later in this chapter as well, that there is reports of the incredible things that Jesus is teaching. He astonishes everyone. People's minds are blown. But we're never given any insight into what Jesus supposedly taught. What were the incredible insights and what was the incredible wisdom that he displayed? It would be really, really I think helpful for us to have that kind of information. And again, Mark here in verse two tells us that the people were amazed. They were amazed at the miracles that Jesus does. Now, it, it's really a topic that we've discussed countless times. Um, you know, people tend to be impressed by miracles. Um, the reality is that no one has a monopoly on miracles. Anyone that reads the Talmud will see that the rabbis of the Talmud did miracles. And we say in Yiddish, every Montek and Donnerstick, every Monday and Thursday, miracles were taking place all of the time. And so the idea that there was someone that was doing miracles that amazed people, it, it's, it's not such a big deal. It's like saying today, that someone went to a concert and they had a great time. So people normally, when they hear a concert performance, they enjoy themselves. Um, it, it, it doesn't really necessarily impress us. And as we'll discuss later on, um, we don't have any corroboration of these alleged miracle stories that Jesus, again, uh, is claimed to have performed. Um, again, it's easy for the gospel writer um, dozens and dozens of years later, Mark is writing approximately 40 years after the death of Jesus. The other writers are writing more than that, 50, 60, 70 years after the death of Jesus. It's very easy to say whatever you want. No one is going to be alive to dispute the stories. In any event, we'll get back to this question. In verse three, um, people ask, this is now, I'm going to be primarily referring to the um, New American Standard translation, NASB version. So in verse three, people ask, is this not the carpenter? 
the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joses and Judas and Simon are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. This is a very difficult verse. So let's think about the implications. They begin saying, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? Now that's unusual. Normally, if you're going to identify someone, you would identify who the father is. And so when you read this verse, you sort of put yourself in a Jerry Springer show and you want to know who is the father. <laughs> when Mark tells us that his mother is Mary, so who is the daddy? Who is the father? And it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. And so when you read the same story in Matthew, chapter 13, verse 55, Matthew tries to clean this up. And when you read Matthew, you'll see there's a very subtle, important change. Matthew has not, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? Mark has, is this not the carpenter's son? Right? Joseph was allegedly a carpenter. So now Matthew manages to get some information here about the father, that Jesus is the son of the carpenter. It doesn't name the father, but Matthew at least brings in a father here. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? That's the way Matthew tries to clean up the problem that we have in Mark. But when you get to the Gospel of John, all the gloves are taken off. They don't beat around the bush anymore. And in John chapter 8, verse 41, you have a very testy exchange between Jesus and a bunch of Pharisees. And they say to him, and they don't hold back, they say, well, we weren't born of fornication. I mean, the implication is, but you were. They're basically accusing Jesus here of being a mamzer or being someone born out of wedlock because there is no record of a father of Jesus. Um, a number of years ago, I don't know if you remember, there was a time in our lifetimes when you couldn't move two feet without seeing a display for this book called The Da Vinci Code. Uh, I remember they had books like The Da Vinci Code Diet Book and they had Da Vinci Code Exercise Books and it was, it was absolutely insane that I ended up collecting about 25 Christian books that were written about the Da Vinci Code. So a number of years ago, I wrote a booklet about the Da Vinci Code. I think it's called The Da Vinci Code, A Jewish Perspective. You can find it for free. You can download it and read it um, on the internet. So I discussed this question of the father of Jesus, and uh, I'm not going to go into the details here, but suffice it to say that Mark really opens up this door by asking this question, having the people asking this question, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? And of course, there's no human father that's mentioned. And so that becomes a sort of pregnant kind of question. Now, the other thing that is a little bit difficult in this verse is if this is the hometown of Jesus, this is supposedly his hometown. And again, when you read the Gospels, the Gospels claim that Jesus had a very unusual birth. It was a virgin birth, but it was announced. And there were angels that came and explained to Jesus' family that, you know, this is not an ordinary little Jewish boy. His mother was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, they get uh, a quite an amazing uh, appraisal of Jesus in, in his infancy and through the birth stories. And so what's interesting is that it's very clear, at least from here in Mark, that 
his family didn't spill these beans to anyone, meaning that there was no discussion in Nazareth about Jesus being some kind of a special child whose father is the Holy Spirit. Obviously, this story of the virgin birth, etc., cetera, um, was not something that people in Nazareth knew about. The other thing which is difficult in this verse is why were people offended? Because the verse again says that, you know, the people are saying, isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary? And aren't his brother James and Joseph and Judah and Simon? That's who the brothers are. And aren't his sisters here with us? And the verse says, and they took offense at him. Why were they offended? What was there to be offended about? So it's possible that the, the offense had something to do with his illegitimate birth, I meaning that this was not something that was necessarily common in Israel. And so maybe that's why there was some scandal about him, meaning they're pointing out, look at this fellow, this carpenter, we know who his family is, but they're scandalized about him because of his questionable genealogy, potentially him having been a mamzer or an illegitimate child, or some of the Christian commentaries to Mark suggest that maybe the scandal was that here he's coming in to the synagogue and he's teaching and he's holding himself up as some kind of a teacher. He's, you know, you don't just get to walk into the synagogue and begin giving lectures. So maybe that was the offense that they knew him. He grew up in that town. They knew that he wasn't anything special. He didn't have any kind of advanced Torah education. They knew what kind of a simple background he had. And they're basically saying, and look, now he's coming in and taking over. He's coming in and and just assuming he can teach us. I mean, it's not clear. I mean, the, the, the commentaries really struggle about what exactly the offense would have been. And what's interesting is that Jesus responds to these people in verse four by saying, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. Which is basically saying that, you know, it's very hard to be a superstar among people who knew you when you were growing up, meaning that, you know, they know you as a little brat. They know you as a little troublemaker. And it's hard for them to take you really, really, really as seriously as you take yourself when you grow up. That is more or less what's going on here. What's interesting is that Jesus seems to speak about himself here as a prophet. Right. He says there's no prophet without honor in, except in his own town. And so the question is, how does he speak about himself as a prophet? Doesn't Jesus know that prophecy had ended about 400 years earlier? How does he refer to himself as a prophet? Unless he's not using the word prophet here in a strict a sense, like a biblical prophet. Maybe he means prophet in the same way that people today would say things like, uh, you know, Bill Gates is a modern prophet or whatever. Um, you know, we, we talk about people that are um, important figures in history sometimes that they, we speak about them as prophets. Um, so it's not clear what he means when he refers to himself as a prophet. The second thing is that if he really does think of himself as a prophet in the lines of a biblical prophet, like in Deuteronomy chapter 18 kind of prophet, so doesn't he realize that you don't get to declare yourself as a prophet? That's not how prophecy works. You don't become a prophet because you anoint yourself or appoint yourself as a prophet. The only way someone could be a, uh, declared a prophet, the only way someone could have the status of a prophet is if the leading 
Torah sages at their at that time accepted them as a prophet because again we've discussed this in the past biblically a false prophet is put to death that's a biblical capital crime the question is how do you know if someone's a true prophet or a false prophet it obviously is not going to be based upon whether the person declares themselves a prophet because obviously every false prophet is going to declare themselves a true prophet so it's not up to the person themselves and what we learn in the book of deuteronomy chapter 17 is that any time there's a question that involves let's say uh, punishment in court someone has to be punished so who decides and deuteronomy 17 tells us that in any question any time there's a question you go to the leading judges of your time. You don't go to any man on the street and say, do you think I look like a prophet? It's not, it's not for you to decide. It's for the Supreme Court, for the Sanhedrin to decide. So it's strange that he simply declares himself a prophet. The other thing I wanted to point out in this verse is that we have, I, I actually, I heard this um, expression over the holiday, over this Last week, the Jewish holiday of Simchat Torah, I was in a synagogue where someone actually used the expression Ein Navi Be'iro. Ein Navi Be'iro, which means there's no prophet in their own city. And what's interesting is that many of the commentaries to the New Testament try to find a source for this saying in Jewish literature, in the Talmud, in the Midrash, they don't find it. You won't find it written down anywhere. And so you'll find many scholars suggest that maybe Jews got this saying from the New Testament. Now, I, I, I don't want to th- say that it's impossible, but I would say that it's, I think it's very, very unlikely that this is a, an expression that Jews only started to use after the New Testament was published um, for a few reasons. Number one, we find in the Gospels already many sayings that were common sayings among Jewish people, um, sayings that you'll find that throughout the Talmud that you find creep into the New Testament. Um, So I think it's more likely that this was a common expression. This was a common saying that people just would say. There was no need to write it down in the Talmud. It was simply a folk saying. And to me, it's more likely that a common folk saying from the first century that was widely used in the Jewish world would find its way into the Greek Testament as opposed to a, an expression that was never used by the Jewish people, and that for some reason, when Jews began studying the Christian Bible, we took this expression in, to, a, a, as our own, to, we adopted it. The reason I find that hard to believe is that Jewish people basically didn't study the New Testament. It was considered to be a heretical work, and... Um, It wasn't a book that Jewish people respected. It wasn't the kind of book that Jewish people were going to be studying and saying, what can we take from it of value? So to me, if I was going to guess which way the influence went, I would guess that this was more likely to be a common folk saying among the people at that time that found its way into the New Testament rather than saying that it was uh, a statement and a saying that originated with Jesus, and then somehow the Jewish people liked it and started adopting it. You know, you find something similar in the Quran. The Quran basically takes um, a number of stories from the Midrash, not stories from the Bible. For example, the famous story that Abraham smashed the idols of his father. That's a story from the Midrash, and it finds its way into the Quran. So what do Muslim scholars claim? Muslim scholars claim that Jews borrowed it from the Quran. I would say 
very, very, very unlikely. To me, it's much more likely that um, that the Islamic writers borrowed it from the Jews. We know that there were many Jewish people living in Arabia at that time, and uh, Muhammad himself used to um, interact with Jewish scholars. So to me, again, the question is, where is it more likely things came from? Um, and I, I would just question whether or not this common uh, scholarly idea that this was uh, something that Jews borrowed from Christians, I would just question that. Now, the next piece we're going to look at is starting with verse um, 7. Um, this little piece going from verse 7 to verse 13, which is where Jesus sends out his disciples on a mission. Uh, basically, he sends them out to preach and to heal, and he gives them instructions. So in verse 12, it says that they went and preach that people should repent. That's what Mark says here in chapter 6, verse 12, that his, the disciples of Jesus went out and they preached that people should repent. Now, what exactly does this mean? When it says that the disciples went and preached that the people should repent, does it mean that they were preaching the same kind of repentance that John the baptizer used to preach? Because we know that at the Jordan River, John the baptizer was preaching for people to repent. What did he mean when he called upon people to repent? Obviously, what it meant was to turn away from their sins, to turn back to following the Torah, and to turn back to obeying God, which is basically when Jews in Judaism, when we think about what it means to repent, in Hebrew we call it teshuvah, which means to return. So it basically means to turn away from our sins, to rectify our behavior, to turn back and re-embrace our relationship with God. That's what it means to repent. But what did these disciples of Jesus mean when they were sent out by Jesus and told to teach people to repent. So again, did they teach repentance in the same way that Judaism and John the baptizer spoke of repentance? Or did they preach that repentance means to believe that Jesus was the Messiah and that his blood is going to be shed to atone for our sins? Is that what they preached? I would find that very, very, very unlikely. There is zero evidence that that's what they preached. I suspect that many Christians, when they read this passage, they assume that's what they were preaching. They were preaching the gospel. They were preaching that people should believe that Jesus is death and his blood is going to atone for their sins and they should put their faith in Jesus. I don't think that's what they preached at all. I don't think there's any evidence they preached that, and I think that all the evidence preaches, I mean, all the evidence points to the fact that repentance to them meant the same thing repentance meant in any synagogue. In verse 13, Mark says that they cast out demons and they healed many people. Now, there's a problem with this. They healed many people? You know, the Talmud says, Tov shebarofim legehenim. Tov shebarofim legehenim. The best doctors are going to hell. Why? Because often the best doctors are able to heal the most people. And they begin to think that they're the ones that healed the person. Once you begin to think that you are the healer and not recognize it, it's God that does the healing. God is just using you as a tool. That's already idolatry. That's a denial of God. And so for Mark to say here that these disciples of Jesus, that they healed people, is a very, very big problem. They did not heal anyone. Only God heals. In verse 14, we now have 
the story of Herod and the death of John the baptizer. I really get a kick when all of the Christian I have here in front of me. This is a um, New Revised Standard Version Bible, but I think many of them refer to John as John the Baptist. Sounds like, you know, he wasn't a Presbyterian. He was a Baptist. Not the case. He was really John the baptizer. In Hebrew, he would have been called Yohanan Hamat Biel, Hamat Biel, the immerser. He immersed people in the Jordan River. So in verse 14, now here we have a very interesting, I think, this the um, difference between uh, different translations of Mark. In the New American Standard Version, which I'm using, it says that Herod heard of what was going on. I guess he must have heard about all these preachings and all these healings. And Jesus, his name, the name of Jesus became well known. So Jesus's fame was spreading. And in the New American Standard Bible, it says that people were saying, people were saying that John the baptizer has risen from the dead. John the baptizer has risen from the dead. And that's why Jesus has these miraculous powers. That's how the verse reads in the New American Standard Version. But if you go to, the, for example, the New King James Version, the NKJV, it says not that people were saying that John the baptizer has risen from the dead, but this other translation has that it was Herod himself. It was Herod who thought this. It was Herod who thought that this Jesus was doing these miracles through the power of a risen John the baptizer. So it's interesting um, how to understand this passage. In verse 15, you now see a little bit, you get a little bit of an insight into what was going on at that time, what people were like, what was going on in the heads of people. Because in verse 15, it says, but others were saying that he, meaning Jesus, is Elijah. And others were saying that he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. So this was the discussion. This was what people were saying about Jesus. It's interesting that no one was suggesting that he might be the Messiah. What people are saying at this point is that maybe he's Elijah, the prophet, or maybe he's some other prophet maybe like just a prophet, just like they had in the old times. What's interesting is if you go to the Gospel of John in chapter 1, in the Gospel of John, verses 19 to 21, so there it tells us that people thought that John the baptizer might have been the Messiah. It's interesting. Here in Mark, no one is speculating that Jesus might be the Messiah. But in the book of John, chapter one, people were speculating, maybe this John the baptizer, maybe he's the Messiah. And he said, no, I'm not. I'm not. And they asked him then, are you Elijah? Maybe, if you're not the Messiah, maybe you're Elijah the prophet. And John said, no, I'm not. And they asked him if he was just a regular prophet. And he said, no. So you see, what's interesting is that in the first century, and we know this from Jewish history, there already was a certain amount of excitement that things were developing. There was a, a tremendous amount of messianic speculation in the first century, messianic expectation. And so you see that when John the baptizer is doing his thing at the Jordan River, there are people who suspect maybe he's the Messiah. And okay, you're not the Messiah, maybe you're Elijah the prophet or some other prophet. 
here in the book of Mark, in chapter 6 at least, no one is even suggesting that Jesus is the Messiah. But there is speculation that maybe he's Elijah the prophet or some other prophet. In verse 16, we get now um, Herod. He's hearing about all these discussions. And again, here you have, I think, a discrepancy between the New King James Version and the New American Standard Version translations. Um, here in verse 16, it says, when Herod heard of it, he kept saying, John, whom I beheaded, has risen? Meaning that according to the New American Standard Bible, he was saying that anyone who thinks that this Jesus is Elijah the prophet, they're out of their mind because I beheaded this John the baptizer. Uh, it doesn't make any sense that, that people are saying that, um, you know, that people that were suggesting that Jesus is able to do miracles through the power of John the baptizer who's been, who's risen again. So one way of reading verse 16 is, John, is, is Herod is saying, what are you talking about? Anyone who believes that John the baptizer has risen is a fool because he was beheaded. He was beheaded. However, in the New King James Version, it seems that Herod himself now is believing this. The way the New King James Version translates this verse is that Herod himself begins to believe that John the baptizer has arisen. He suspects that maybe he has come back from the dead. So again, two ways of reading that verse. In verses 17 through 19, we read the famous story that Herod married Herodias, who was the wife of his brother, Philip. So Herod had a brother named Philip, and Herod marries Herodias, who is the wife of his brother. And John, the baptizer, had told him that it was not legal to marry his brother's wife. Her Herod was warned by John the baptizer you can't do that. And Herodias, because of this, Herodias had a tremendous grudge against John the baptizer and wanted to execute him. But she wasn't able to have that happen because we're told in verse 20 that Herod was afraid of John because John was holy and John was righteous and he respected John the baptizer. And actually, again, according to the New American Standard, the New American Standard translation, he actually enjoyed listening to John the baptizer preaching. So even though his wife Herodias wanted John the baptizer killed, uh, Herod was reluctant to do it. Now, we have a famous story now in verses 21 to 29 where we're told that the daughter of Herodias danced at a big dinner party and she pleased, her dancing pleased Herod and all the guests. So Herod says to her in this story, ask for whatever you want and I'll give it to you even up to half the kingdom. This is a phrase that's borrowed from the book of Esther because King Ahasuerus offers Esther, whatever you want, ask for it. I'll give it to you up to half the kingdom. So the daughter of Herodias asked her mother, she asked Herodias, what should she ask for? What kind of gift should she ask for from Herod? And her mother said, ask for the head of John the baptizer. If Herod wants to know what kind of a gift you want, you tell him that you want the head of John the baptizer. And the king was very sorry. The king, again, we were told previously, 
didn't really want to kill John the baptizer, but we're told now that because of the promise he made to this girl and because of his dinner guests, he didn't want to look like he was reneging on an oath in front of his guests. So he was unwilling to refuse her. And he had John the baptizer beheaded in prison and the head was brought back on a platter. Must have been a beautiful platter given to this girl. And the girl gave it back to her mother, Herodias. And the disciples of John the baptizer, because we know that John the baptizer had a, quite a large following. So they buried his body, his headless body in a tomb. Now, in verses 30 to 44, we have the very, very famous story of Jesus feeding a crowd of 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. This is the miracle of multiplying the loaves of bread and the fish to be able to feed 5,000 people. Again, what we find is the Gospels keep on doubling down over and over again on the alleged miracles that are done by Jesus. This is one of the main themes in the Gospels, over and over and over again, miracle after miracle after miracle. And it's important, again, just to remember that there is no corroboration of any of these stories. There's no corroboration in Josephus or in Philo or in any Roman historian or in the Talmud, anywhere. The only place that records these miraculous healings and other miracles is in the Gospels. And it's important to remember that not only is there no corroboration, but the gospel writers themselves are not objective. They're not historians, they're not journalists, they're not people that are objective. As a matter of fact, John, the gospel writer John, tells us in chapter 20, verse 31, he says, these stories are being written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah. He's telling us these stories are being written for a purpose. And the question is, is it possible that the gospel writers would invent miracle stories or exaggerate miracle stories in order to be more effective at selling Jesus? The answer is, of course they would. There's no question about it. How do we know that? Because we have thousands of examples today where Christian evangelists are basically making up stories of healings and miracles in order to sell Jesus. Nothing has changed. How do I know that they've, make, they've made up stories? Because Not because of any research I did, because other Christians investigate many of these healing and miracle stories, and they've decided, they've concluded, that there's no evidence to these stories that they're made up. So that's one thing to bear in mind when we read the miracle stories of Jesus. The other thing to bear in mind is that the Tanakh never tells us that we will recognize the Messiah by miracles that he will do. This is never given as a messianic criteria because miracles can be done by anyone. We know that in Egypt, the magicians of Pharaoh were able to replicate some of the plagues that were done by Moses. We know that in chapter 13 of Deuteronomy, that false prophets are given the ability to do miracles in order to test people. Matthew tells us in chapter 24, verse 24, that false messiahs are able to do miracles in order to be able to mislead even the elect. So obviously, if false messiahs can do miracles, then a miracle could never prove that someone is the real messiah. The truth is that the Tanakh gives criteria for the Messiah that cannot be replicated by an imposter. If you read what the Tanakh says about what the world will look like when the Messiah arrives, these are changes in the world that cannot be done by someone who's not the Messiah. These are once 
in a history of the world occurrence, that the whole world is going to come to believe in God, that the whole world is going to be in peace, that all weapons of war will be destroyed, that the entire nation of Israel is going to live in their land in peace. All of the prophecies that are told about the days of the Messiah are prophecies that can only be done once and by the real Messiah. They cannot be done by anyone else. We're told in verse 34 here that Jesus began to teach the multitudes many things. And again, it's too bad that we don't get a report on what he actually taught. In verses 48 to 49, the famous story of Jesus walking on the sea. But his disciples, they didn't assume that it was Jesus who was doing this miracle. His own disciples didn't say, wow, he must be some great, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, they didn't think it meant he was the Messiah. They certainly didn't think it meant that he was God. The assumption of the disciples was that it's a ghost. It's an apparition. That's how unconvincing this miracle was even to the very disciples of Jesus. Now, in verse 50, Jesus tells them, no, it's me. <laughs> it's not, an, it's not a, a ghost. It's not an apparition. It's me. And in verse 51, Jesus gets into the boat with them and the wind stops and they were greatly astonished. They're greatly astonished. But in verse 52, the gospel writer says that they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves. When Jesus multiplied the loaves and fed, fed 5,000 people, the gospel writer here says that the disciples, the followers of Jesus, his students, didn't gain any insight from that event, and their heart was hardened. So his own disciples were being told were clueless. They were clueless. So I just want to um, end with one last verse. This is verse 56. And here we're told um, that many people came to touch the fringe of his coat, of his cloak, and were healed. People came to touch the fringe of the cloak of Jesus, and they were healed. And I think this is a significant story because the word that's used for fringe here is, I may not pronounce the Greek properly, but I think it's something like krospidon. And krospidon is the exact same Greek word, um, I'm sorry, the same Aramaic word that's used for tzitzit, for the ritual fringes that are to be put on the corners of our garments that we find in uh, the book of Numbers, chapter 15, at the end of that chapter. So it seems that people were not just touching the edge, the corner of his cloak, they were touching the fringes, the tzitzit, on the corners of Jesus' garment. And I think it's significant because, again, in, in many of my lectures and in our discussion of the book of Matthew, um, I take very seriously the possibility that Jesus was a Torah observant Jew. Um, I'm not married to this idea, but I find it quite plausible that Jesus did not reject the observance of the mitzvot, the observance of the commandments of the Torah, that he himself taught his disciples to follow the Torah, and that here we see an example of Jesus following a ritual law of the Torah. Um, now, again, I don't know if I would say this is proven a thousand percent, but to me, it's fairly clear when we weigh all of the evidence, and we've, re we've reviewed this in the past, um, it seems pretty clear to me that Jesus and his disciples, at least initially, were people who followed the Torah. 
And the, devi the deviation from following the Torah clearly comes at a later point. I would propose that it begins through the teachings and the preachings of Paul. But it seems that at this point, prior to Paul, um, Jesus is someone who is basically Torah observant. And it wasn't part of the program at this point to preach that the Torah now has been done away with. Um, so that's more or less what I wanted to share on Mark chapter 6. And uh, hopefully okay. um, we should all be well. Um, we'll be back next week to do chapter 7, I hope. And we should all hear good news from the Holy Land. Very uh, good. God should protect the people in the Holy Land. God should protect everyone in the world. Absolutely. Um, and uh, we should see good news from the Holy Land that the uh, people who were wounded and captured should be healed and restored and that whatever the IDF is going to have to do in the coming days, they should be successful and God should protect the soldiers. Very good. And just for the record, once again, this is October 16th, 2023. I know we got uh, about 10 years worth of videos out there. So a few years from now, you don't panic if you see this. Um, but I did just hear back from Rabbi Singer. He is fine. Baruch Hashem. Uh, Gabriel Sanders, our Hebrew in-house Hebrew scholar, is fine. Um, Shannon Newsom needs your prayer. She's in the hospital for health reasons uh, that she was, uh, she was pretty nervous about. So uh, if you guys want to lift her up in your thoughts and prayers, that would be great too. So, Rabbi, thank you. Um, really missed, missed having you here. Glad you're back. And uh, we look forward to Hashem Willing, same time, same place next week for Mark Chapter 7. Thank you all for tuning in. And be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, turn on notifications, and we will see you on the other side. Take care, Rabbi. Love you guys. Peace. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanakhtalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom. Shafa.